Ever since the days when early humans' first sparks of consciousness arose from their bicameral minds, they have looked skywards at the birds, bats, and bugs and dreamed of flying. And then, ever since Icarus flew too close to the sun, melted his janky ass wings, and plunged into the ocean like an idiot, we have figured that it would be a lot safer and cheaper to somehow control a flying machine while staying firmly on the ground with the things we need, like shelter, fresh water, and our Taco Bell. Skip it up and up. Without further ado, let's rewind to 1938, when Walter A. Good and his brother William are credited with the first successful radio-controlled flight at the Kalamazoo, Michigan airport. The aircraft was called Big Guff, and they designed it specifically for radio-controlled flight. But this isn't exactly where radio control got its roots, believe it or not. The ancient historical text, known as Wikipedia, tells us that the first forms of human-constructed flying machines were likely built in the 5th century BC in China, just like our modern RC airplanes. The aircraft they built were called kites. As far as we can tell, they are a kind of control line airplane. Moving forward to the 19th century, Alphonse Panou was a French pioneer of aviation design and engineering. And what do you know, he made a model aircraft called Planifor. Pardon the pronunciation. If it looks familiar to the Wright brothers' first airplane, it's because, well, the Planifor was a major influence on early aircraft design. At the time, this was the first demonstration of inherent stability in flight. The wings were swept at the tips, which in effect provided dihedral in the wings. During 1870, he also experimented with a series of model helicopters, but believe it or not, this principle was not all that new to the French. All the way back in 1784, the naturalist M. Lunois and M. Bievenu created a model helicopter that relied on rubber bands to power it. While all of the aforementioned examples are technically free flight, we felt it was important not to write the roots of model aviation out of history. There are early examples of electronically guided airships that were filled with hydrogen and flown around music halls using a basic form of spark-emitted radio signal, but not much information is available on that. However, we all know that sparks and hydrogen are an excellent combination though, so we imagine everybody had a wonderful time. Now, you might remember that it was said that Walter A. Good and his brother were credited with that first flight in 1938. But there's actually an earlier example of radio control from a name you might recognize, Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla didn't exactly fly a plane, but he was the original patent holder of a wireless control system. He called this Telautomatics. This was back in 1897, and his first demonstration of the technology was with a remote-controlled boat that happened a year later. Moving forward to the 20th century, this was around the same time that model aircraft were starting to be powered by miniature internal combustion engines. An RC contest was scheduled for the 1936 Model Aircraft Nationals in Detroit. However, this was arguably the most boring RC contest to this day, considering not a single entrant showed up. A year later in 1937, a whopping six entrants showed up. Then, shortly thereafter, Ross Hole was an avid modeler from Australia who flew his 13-foot RC glider at a famous glider site located in Elmira, New York. Shortly after that, Ross Holt died when he contacted 6,000 volts while he was working on an early television receiver. Shortly thereafter, Leo Weiss created an 8-channel radio that used a tone reed system. These used metal rods to resonate with the transmitted signal and operate a number of different relays. A few more years went by and more advances were made in the hobby, such as a multifunction single-channel RC system that was developed by Thracy Petrides and Leon Hillman during 1941. But most notably, FCC Order 130-C went into effect on March 1, 1946, where the FCC created a 6-meter band allocation for amateur service. This effectively gave modelers nearly personalized frequency at flying fields, at least for those who knew something about radio theory. By 1949, Ed Rockwood developed a multi-channel system, which was the first commercial venture for a Reed radio. Then, in 1951, the familiar SIG Manufacturing Company was formed by Hazel and her husband, Glenn, to supply balsa and radio-controlled parts to modelers. This also marked the first and only female to ever be interested in model aviation. They also flew full-scale aerobatic planes together. Today, they finally updated their website for the first time since 1951 and went with Shopify, the e-commerce platform. 1952 rolled around and the FCC granted use of the 27.255 MHz frequency, which was the first license-free band. Within the next five years, a complete five-channel read-set radio was sold. The doors to model aviation began opening up. Transmitters up until 1956 were extremely large with heavy tubes and batteries. In fact, they weren't even called radio controllers yet. They were referred to as control box transmitters. 
A desire for a comfortable and portable radio was seen in the market, and so began Bramco's rush to develop the handheld transmitter. By 1961, Bonner released a relayless servo called the Transmite. The first RC jet was also flown with a Dynapulse jet in a Reed radio system with Jerry Nelson at the controls. During this time, hobbyists started moving away from traditional Reed systems to proportional systems instead. If you're wondering what the hell proportional system means, it means it's proportional, you nitwit. You see, back in the early days of radio control, you might have noticed that controls were more of a non-off switch. Proportional control systems are like the radios you see today though. Throttle isn't just on and off, it's zero up through 100%. These were complex systems that used relays to control a rubber-powered escapement's speed and direction. But it didn't just stop here. By 1962, the first commercial digital RC system was made by Howard Bonner. The radio was called Digicon. Their system was tagged Digimite and made the news again when their 8-channel system was released. The FCC was keeping up too. 1965 marks the date when the FCC granted five frequencies on the 72 MHz band with 80 kHz spacing to modelers. Most radios up to this point were approximately $500, which is a lot now, but a lot back in the 60s. That was until proportional control systems released a revolutionary low-priced, complete proportional system with servos and batteries for only $299. Several other radio companies fell under shortly after this because they simply could not compete with that price point. Now, we're arguably starting to get into the golden era of RC with Phil Kraft's infamous line of radios. The Gold Medal series was a proportional system which released in 1968 after winning the gold medal at the Corsica Italy World Championships. Tower Hobbies was formed in 1971 by Bruce Holokek and a year later, Great Plains Model Distributors was also born. Remember them? RIP. By 1975, Transmitters began featuring modern conveniences such as servo reversing, adjustable travel, and even dual rates. A year later, the cheapest radio was released by the toy company Mattel that was a single-channel pulse proportional system and was sold for only $29. The innovations didn't stop there, as Kraft Systems introduced the first synthesized RC system. That meant that the radio allowed its pilot to change frequencies using the same transmitter and receivers. This was especially useful if somebody was flying on your frequency and you had to change, or if somebody that you didn't like was flying. You could change to their frequency, turn on your transmitter, and shortly they wouldn't be flying anymore. In 1980, Glenn from SIG Manufacturing passed away when he was killed during one of their aerobatic demos in Centerville, Iowa. Hazel understandably decided to stop flying shows and got together with one of her modeling friends, Maxie. She married Maxie in 1981. Shortly after, JR Radios came to the world of RC around 1982, where they competed by offering an array of valuable programming features. One radio could now have many different models on it. You could name your airplane. You could even set various parameters such as servo travel limits, dual, and get this, triple rates, and most notably, Expo. 1985 rolled around and Tower Hobbies combined with Great Plains to form Hobbyco Incorporated. Hobbyco was a manufacturer and distributor of everything from radio-controlled planes, boats, and cars up through jigsaw puzzles. Once again, RIP. During 1985, the RC giant Horizon Hobby was founded by Rick Stevens, an American entrepreneur. In 1987, the FCC granted some additional channels on the 72 MHz band and allowed even more by 1988. In 1988, SIG Manufacturing entered the Model Aviation Hall of Fame. By 1998, her and her new husband, Maxi, sold SIG. Skipping ahead a bit, 2004 marked the year the first commercial RC system using spread spectrum technology was introduced by Spectrum. It was released to the market in 2005 as the DX6 Park Flyer system. The radio operated on 2.4 GHz and Paul Beard developed the DSM we know today. Speaking of toys, 2013 rolled around and Horizon Hobby announced that their company was being bought by a group of investors led by Horizon CEO, Joe Ambrosi. Yay! Hobbyco ran into some trouble on January 10, 2018, where they filed for bankruptcy protection and announced that the company was for sale. Horizon Hobby swooped in and acquired control of a majority of Hobbyco brands and IP. Most notably left out was Great Plains Manufacturing. Rip. November of 2021 rolled around, and Horizon bought Real Flight RC Simulator from Knife Edge Software. It's estimated that another 500 discontinued Horizon airplanes will be added to the simulator by 2050 without a single update to the physics engine, while the price remains at an uncomfortable $99. A lot was left out here because there's simply too much to talk about in one video, but go ahead and let us know down below what we missed. Go ahead and give this video a thumbs up if you think you could have flown on a radio that looked like this. 
or maybe even hit subscribe if you're interested in hearing a detailed look into 3D's roots. Also, we know we've been hinting at some content where we've committed unspeakable act of timbers lately, but that's coming shortly. Happy landings, bounce one on for us, and we'll catch you next week with a new upload.